What's going on, guys? It is a glorious day on the Glorious Sunrise Podcast, the Magic the Gathering podcast hosted by myself. I'm Kevin from It Resolves, and... I'm Country Pride from Country Pride. <laughs> Look at that. I'm John. There it is. Hey, man. We I'm found sorry. it. Nah, dude, we, we're good. So, guys, uh, for, for anybody who doesn't know or hasn't been following either Country Pride's channel or the It Resolves channel, uh, Country Fried and I collaborated on a series called It Is What It Is. It was a jank deck series. We had a lot of fun with it. And out of that series uh, came the idea, or the genesis of the idea for this podcast, which is the Glorious Sunrise podcast. We're hoping to do this weekly, hoping to hang out with you guys and have some fun and talk about magic. Now today, we're kind of pushing through and doing a little bit of test run stuff. This is a first round, so this is literally... <laughs> Literally the first time we have sat down to record, we, we're not doing a test run. This is it. And uh, the whole idea is to get some content on the brand new set, Streets of New Capenna. We're going to be talking about our favorite cards, our top picks from each section. We'll talk about all that as we go. But first and foremost, I got to ask Country Fried, how you doing, buddy? I'm doing good, man. I'm doing really good. I missed our time away from each other. And Dude. speaking of which, just to, I mean, reciprocate. How are you doing? You got back from the honeymoon. Did you guys have a I great did. time? Yes, dude. I absolutely did. I uh I'll I'll give you details in the outro because uh we'll we'll talk about a little bit of our outside of magic stories as we uh conclude this episode. But in short, yes, it was an absolute blast. We had a, a really nice time uh and got to got to just soak up some rays, man, sit on the beach, drink a I'm lot. Jealous. It was great jealous yeah dude i appreciate it that's good man that's good everybody needs to relax every once in a while 100 percent agree it was fantastic so uh guys like i said the topic today we are looking at our favorite cards from streets of new capenna we're gonna jump right in but just to clarify the way that we're gonna be doing this is starting off in white we're gonna go to blue black red green we're gonna talk multicolor artifacts uh, and lands. So we're kind of splitting it into those sections. Each of us has picked a top card from each of those sections, as well as included some honorable mentions, which I think we'll actually start with. I think that probably makes the most sense uh, to just tar start there. Do you want to kick us off? With honorable mentions? Yeah, let's do honorable yeah, mentions Yeah, we can first. do that, man. You totally messed up the way I had everything set up here. Good. I'm glad. <laughs> oh, so this is why we don't test for <laughs> silly things like this to happen, so everybody can laugh at us. All right. So for uh, my honorable mention, everybody knows I play Esper, and my deck that I built from scratch has been the Conceived Machine. It's been running since uh, D and D 2022. So my honorable mention will go to a card that I will absolutely 100% play, <laughs> and that is Voidrend. That is the new Esper Instant. The spell cannot be countered, and it will destroy target non-land permanents. Dude. And that is my honorable mention. So I have to ask, because I'm a bit of an Esper lover, too. I do love any, really any three-color strategy I'm generally into, but Esper seems really powerful. Voidrend mm -hmm. is a card I was looking at as well. Uh, it seems like a great catch-all. Can't be countered. Seems really important to me. And, of course, instant speed is really, really good. Where do you see this having the most impact, though? Do you think it's standard? Do you think this hits any eternal formats? What are you thinking? Well, I mean, I think, yeah, I definitely think it's definitely hitting standard. Yeah. Uh, this is going to be perfect for control matchups, especially stuff like uh, Azorius Control when you match up against it with your Esper decks because you've got, like, uh, you're still going to have the Celestis out and you've still got the Fairies and you're still going to see Planeswalkers and stuff like that. But uh, I definitely think this has a fit in Commander. Mm. because in commander it's not hard to get your three colors aligned and i mean being able to destroy any target non-land permanent in commander could be absolutely huge but uh yeah i definitely think for the standard side of it it's definitely going to be uh best against your control matchups and then of course i mean it's kind of a catch-all since you're destroying target non-land permanents it it can basically go against anything it'll help you against your aggros and stuff like that but you just you know you got to be selective with it just yeah. So, which is what Esper is. Esper is all about sit back and then just do your assassin type things with your with your Esper color magic, and you just pick apart another opponent's deck. Dude, hundred percent agree. I will say uh, one thing. Obviously, that they kind of designed into the card being Esper colors. Like you do have to be a little bit concerned. I feel like for that mana cost, how easy mm -hmm. do you think? In, in particular, I'm going to say in standard, 
Um, and I'm saying this knowing that the triumphs for stand mm -hmm. for this now exist, but how how difficult do you, I mean, how many times throughout, I'll say, you know, 20 games, do you think you're going to run into an issue where you can't necessarily play this on turn three? Not saying you would need to, just thinking in terms of the, the flexibility of the card, because, I mean, three colors, three separate colors on turn three is sometimes kind of difficult. <laughs> Yeah, no, definitely. Um, I would say out of twenty time or twenty games played, being able to cast this on turn three, you're probably gonna be a maybe a forty five, fifty percent. Okay. To, just to be honest. Yeah. Um, I mean the triumphs are gonna help. Um, but the way like I'm thinking uh, what I've currently got my um, land base built as in the Esper deck that I've currently got. And I've definitely got to go in and retool it. And the Triomes are going to play a huge part in that. So it may get easier, but I would say right now off the top of my head, just to get it out on turn three, you're looking at probably about a 45 to 50% chance. Yeah. You're still going to run either your Vanishing Verses or your Belfa Masteries as backups. You can't just go a four and four of. Yeah. But this is definitely going to be one that you could run a four of Whereas before we got this, we had Vanishing Verse and Belfo Mastery in the deck list that I played, and I played it as split. I was either playing it as a two and two or a two and three. Yeah. Well, no, and I think um, I agree with your percentages there and everything. My my perception is nine times out of ten, you're not going to want to play this on turn three anyway. Uh, right. I think it's very rare that that would be the case. However, having that ability and that flexibility to play it on turn three is certainly something that I think any Esper player is going to hope for, just in the case that you find something really, really strong out the gate that you really feel you need to, to deal with, in particular an aggro matchup, something like that. So I was just curious your thoughts there, but great honorable mention pick, in my opinion. Uh, funny yeah. enough... Uh, to transition into my honorable mention, I mm -hmm. also picked multicolor cards, which makes sense given this is a tri-colored set. <laughs> um, but I did go, and I, I kind of cheated a little bit. I went for the charm cycle with particular right. emphasis on the Riveteer's charm, uh, which is the Jund charm, uh, which in my opinion, I think is the strongest. So I'll just read this mm. one uh, as an example. So it's instant. Obviously, they all are. Uh, black, red, green is the color combination you need, uh, and you choose one. So you got three options here, as with all of them. Target opponent sacrifices a creature or planeswalker they control with the highest mana value among creatures and planeswalkers they currently control. You can exile the top three cards of your library, and then until the next end step, you can play those cards, or you can exile target player's graveyard. Uh, and funny enough, I pick this one for a multitude of reasons, but uh, the what caught my eye with this was something that the professor talked about. I watched his video on some of the cards that might impact modern. Modern in particular is a format that I really love. I've kind of started delving into it a little bit on the channel. Uh, and I think this sets up so many different, like just really powerful scenarios on turn three. Uh, being able to basically soul shatter something immediately is really, really nice. Being able to essentially draw three cards by sacrificing one at instant speed at the end of your opponent's turn and then have those cards available for your next turn is pretty powerful also. And then, not that this is a good rate for it, but exiling target player's graveyard is pretty relevant in a lot of different scenarios, uh, in particular in the eternal formats. And so I found this to be the most powerful, but I think all of the the charms, especially in standard, are really going to shine. Yeah, no, I agree. Um, and the Riveter's Charm, it looks great. And the Exile Target Player's Graveyard's huge. And then again, like you said, the top three, and then your opponent sacrifice. I mean, there's uh, their utility cards. Their yeah. utility cards where you just pick, uh, depending on what the situation is within the matchup, and uh, where you have the card and you're allowed to cast it. I like them. I like them. I know I've seen a bunch of people saying that they were kind of down on the charms, that they thought they were weak for standard, and that may be the case. But uh, I wouldn't be surprised if these things start popping up all over the place. I think... Um with the 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 possibility now or at least a push towards those three color decks in standard i think these are cards anytime we see charms printed in standard they feel very flexible very useful in most mm -hmm. situ situations and i'm not saying they're perfect and certainly some are better than others but in particular things like the riveteer charm feel very good because there are options even against i can think of a lot of scenarios where that would be just a useful effect and worst case scenario you're basically getting three cards off the top of your deck and hopefully finding something you need so i feel like no matter what there's a use for it 
Um, and then in particular, it's kind of a silver bullet, especially against graveyard decks. It, it seems really good. So uh, to me, it just seemed like a really good card. I love the charms, always do. So I'm happy to have a new cycle of them here. Yeah, no, outstanding pick. And I, I even like the obscure charm. I mean, you've got target creatures out there with the mana value three or less and the planeswalkers that you can destroy. Um, you got the multicolored permanent with mana value three or less that you can return from your graveyard. So, you know, if yeah. you had another one that was, that was, uh, if you had like a, one of the new enchants in your graveyard, you could utilize that. And then, of course, the obscure charm's second ability is what I was looking at was the counter target instant or source spell yeah very so, very good yeah charms are always tricky man i and i and i like i said i saw a lot of people kind of getting down on them thinking that they were weak this time around but i you just can't ever put them out of the show i don't think so i think they just do too much it's it's really hard to make that work but uh yeah. with that being said that is our honorable mentions out of the way so we can move on to white and i'll let you kick off here uh we you picked an interesting one uh, uh -huh. but i really like it uh, so talk me through this, please. Okay, so the one that I didn't pick was Revelation <laughs> of Safety. <laughs> because that, you know, it it's a two drop. And I think Mono White's got a lot of two drops. So my my pick for Mono White was Boon of Safety. Or was it Revelation? Was it Revelation of it's, Safety? I think I it's know. Revelation of Power. Maybe it's Revelation of Power, mistaken. where you put the plus one, plus ones yeah. and stuff. But Boon of Safety is my pick, because it is a one cost, one one white uh, instant, and you put a shield counter on target creature, and then you scry a card. And I think the way Mono White's just dominating the meta field right now, um, cool, man. Thanks. Yeah. I appreciate you giving Mono White more power. <laughs> <laughs> so, look, I, the reason I didn't pick a two drop or anything higher is Mono White's still pretty stacked in the meta, the way it's built. And yeah. um, that's why we don't see Lion Sash in any of Mono White. Mono White didn't have any any spot for a two drop, any flex. It, it's got Thali, it's got the Luminarch Aspirants and stuff like that. However, Mono White's got flex in the one drop spot. Yeah. Um, their one drops aren't always great i mean there's usher and stuff like that but this is going to start protecting their creatures that actually skew the game they can protect a redane with this they can protect the thalia with this and they get to scry a card yeah Man, make me want to hit my head against the wall mono Dude, white 100 percent. so <laughs> one thing we should mention is the the shield mechanic is obviously new mm -hmm. for the set um and we'll, we'll we'll see this repeated we'll see some new mechanics as we talk through these cards but uh just for clarification purposes a shield counter says that if a creature would be dealt damage or destroyed, instead you remove that shield counter from it. So what this represents is essentially a trade for a spell, in my view. So as an example, if you're going to burn a Thalia off the field and you use your boon of safety provi to, to provide that shield counter, mm -hmm. instead they have to basically burn it again <laughs> uh, okay. or find another way to deal with it. Um, and in particular, as you mentioned, with Mono White, that's such a powerful ability a, because it is only one mana. Uh, B, it does scry, and so you're able to filter the top of your deck, which is obviously something Mono White really wants to do towards that mid game to be able to, to guarantee more, more powerful spells or something to continue to add to the board. Um, but then obviously later on, it just, it, either way, it's, it's a two for one, right? Like it's a one mana yeah. trade. I mean, that's, I'm into that. Well, and that, and the way they got taxes going, you know, um, and like you said, you got to burn twice. Well, yep. you're already taxing their first one and yep. you're taxing their second one. So the chances of them getting through it on one single turn, by the time Mono White can output damage, you pretty much killed them. Yep. And um, and I mean, you know, maybe you want to maybe want to protect up your Brutal Cathar, depending on what you uh, put underneath it. So instead of returning it back to your opponent when they kill your Brutal Cathar, now you've got a little bit of protection, whereas um, the Apparition exiles it and then they get that token. Yeah. Cathar gives it back. And this just kind of, you know, this kind of changes up the game plan for Mono White and kind of just add, adds a little bit of a shield to them so yeah. it's fitting it is the shield counter so uh, definitely buffers them out and it definitely gives them some options through turns three and four which really really irritate me 
Yeah. Because that is not I, a deck I want to see get options. I'm a little tired of mono white, I'll be honest. I'm sure listeners are probably in the same boat. Or as stark contrast, they love mono white and they're so stoked to have this. It's probably one of the two. Um yeah. by contrast, uh, you know, you're you're picking a card that is potentially really competitively viable, especially in that mono white list, um, mm -hmm. and at common as well, which is really cool. Uh I did not pick a, a competitively viable card <laughs> yeah. at all. Um, well, maybe. We'll see. But I, liked I don't. It. I liked it. I think it's really fun. So, Rabble Rousing is my pick. It's an enchantment, four and a white. Does feature the hideaway mm -hmm. mechanic, which we haven't seen in quite a while. Originally printed in Lorwyn. Uh, hideaway, this, this is Hideaway 5. It says, when this enchantment enters the battlefield, look at the top five cards since it's Hideaway 5. Uh, exile one face down, then put the rest on the bottom in a random order. So that gar that card goes under the rabble rousing, essentially hidden away, hence the hideaway mechanic. Uh, then the ability on the card actually says, when you attack with one or more creatures, create that many 1-1 one, one green and white citizen creature tokens. Then if you control 10 or more creatures, you can play the exiled card without paying its cost. Uh, these hideaway enchantments are actually part of a cycle, so there are some in other colors, but I don't think any of the other ones made the list. Um, here's the thing. <laughs> Here, here's the thing. If you're if you're a friend of it resolves, uh, or I think Country Fried as well. If you're a friend of either of our channels, you have seen a, numerous cards that <laughs> that make the cut very often in some of our decks. Uh, some of which are actually competitively viable. I would suggest Scoot Swarm as a great mm -hmm. example of a card that is really good in standard right now. It certainly works well with this card, uh, and it does in, it just really kind of bolster up the board very quickly. It also works really well with things like Prosperous Innkeeper, which is a really good life gain card, so you get a lot of extra life. Um, on the flip side, on the, on the janky <laughs> side of things, if you guys like Anointed Procession, we just got a great new addition to that deck. Uh, being able to double the tokens that come into play just seems ridiculous to me uh and for the fact that this 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 hits for every creature you're attacking with which is insane yeah. to me normally you would be like you know this only happens once each once each turn that seems to be a common trend for standard viable cards right now and so for me this is just a good example of a card where they were just like nah we can do it as much as we want it's totally cool we'll make that hideaway <laughs> threshold 10 and think that's enough um so for me, this is just begging to be like broken. Um, not to mention also, you know, I mentioned Prosperous Innkeeper, Scoot Swarm. This implies that you're going to be running green a lot of the time. Uh, there are a lot of really good things in green that you could cast off of this. You know, we've got Storm the Festival. We've got Glorious Sunrise. Just saying, that's the podcast. There are a lot of things in green that currently we would want to ramp into anyway being able to have that added bonus of hiding it away under here and then being able to play it off of it for free, I mean, seems pretty good to me. Uh, and so while it's probably not the most competitively viable card, uh, it is just begging to be broken, in my opinion. Yeah, no, I agree, man. Rabble rousing. So you, I like the way you think, man. <laughs> <laughs> this you is why going, we're doing a podcast together. You were going, you were going Scoot Swarm, Prosperous Innkeeper, Storm Heck the yeah. Festival, Glorious Sunrise. I was like, just a little bit more. You got, what is it? Is it Moon Dancer? Yes, Moon Dancer would be Moon great. Moon Dancer would yeah. just be going absolutely berserk with this. If you put the plus one, plus ones on from uh, the Glorious Sunrise and you gave it Trample, it'd just be going absolutely berserk. Um, and then you've got uh, the, the two-cost instant where if you uh, you get to draw a card for each creature that comes into the battlefield that turn, it's oh. something harmony. Oh, God, you're... You're so, going into my yes, I can't so, think of it, but yes, I know what you're talking about. But that, and then I mean, and that's just Celestia, which I think this fits in a Celestia package more consistent. And I liked where you were going with that. And Storm the Festival can get this out a lot with a lot of other things. You don't have yeah. to go over five cost in Celestia to make a to make a viable deck. You can do the life gain. You can put in the chaplains with the Prosperous Innkeepers. And now Mono Green's got a new one that's doing life gain as well. And however. <laughs> just for the jank aspect of it if you went banned and you okay. cast and you cast um reflection on <laughs> one of your bigger creatures and then 
you know, your one yeah. ones aren't one ones anymore. They're coming in as creatures as copy of whatever creature you targeted. Dude. So you target prosperous innkeeper and you start dropping tokens all over the place. Oh my gosh, I didn't even think of this. <laughs> I mean, yes, this is so... why this exists, guys. For anybody that doesn't know, we're talking jank on the podcast. That's oh, all yeah, this, this is. is uh, this is absolute That's jank. Amazing. This is not. This is not viable. But you're dropping in life gain out the wazoo you're yeah. dropping in treasure tokens all over the place uh yeah man we're gonna make I that viable. I, I absolutely <laughs> look forward to breaking this card <laughs> <laughs> i love it uh yeah it, that's just a silly one for me i had to i had to throw it on there yeah and the hideaway mechanic just to touch on before yeah. we move on um man if you haven't ever played with the hideaway mechanic don't underestimate it um i got used to it by playing commander and uh there there are a lot of viable cards that you can use the hideaway mechanic in there and if you're using something like scoot and landfall and feldar retreats and the moon dancer and the prosperous innkeepers and the storm the festivals getting to cast a card for free off that hideaway is not going to be that hard no it's not. I think it's absolutely doable. Um, some of the other ones I think are a little bit trickier, which is part of why this one really mm -hmm. stuck out to me, uh, because it feels so easy to do. Honestly, it doesn't seem difficult at all. Um, but yeah, I love it. Yeah, I like it. Uh, well, let's move on to blue. Uh, you picked another really interesting one, and there's a trend with yours. They just seem to be combat tricks. Uh, so so oh. what'd you pick for blue? All right, so for blue is definitely because, look, I've got a working theory. Can I go into the theory or we want to hold off and just keep pressing? Allude to it, don't go into detail. Okay. So that right might now, be the next podcast episode. Okay, so. okay. So right now there is a really powerful deck in standard in the meta, and that is the Just Guy combo list. And I think this card fits in there perfectly. This is for one blue, an instant slip out the back, and you put a plus one, plus one counter on target creature, and it phases out. So, what's your target? Your gold span dragon. You get to target the gold span dragon. You get to put a plus one, plus one counter on the gold span dragon. So, you're making another treasure token off of it, and you're phasing it out from any protection it needs, depending on whether they're dropping the doom scar to wipe the board, whether they're trying to target it with an infernal grasp or whatever. You're saving your gold span dragon. I think this card is absolutely going to break Just Guy uh, combo wide open. I can't but agree. It's crazy to me that this is like just one mana knowing yeah. that that deck exists right now um, I know. now again keep in mind outside of that deck i certainly think there are uses for this however it's very i think very clearly at its best exactly as you said in that just guy list um mm -hmm. i do see other decks that kind of work a lot of blue tempo style decks um weird like delver fringe decks that try to be good but are less good than the just guy deck like a lot of those oh, yeah. things can work um but yeah, I think because of the existence of that deck, it's crazy to me that this got printed almost. Well, and I think it phases out another popular card right now. I think mm -hmm. Fading Hope can actually get phased out by this card because it works with Lear. It works yeah. with Hallbreaker. Hallbreaker gets busted with this one drop. If you've got Fading Hope and this card in there, yeah. how many cards can you cast uh, off of Hallbreaker when it comes in on your opponent's turn and just start returning their whole entire board? Yeah, 100% you know? agree. It it's, just gets uh, out of control. Yeah, it's it's a simple card, but a very crazy powerful card, given mm. the meta. I think this is a great example of a card that, because of the meta right now, is something that we have to keep an eye on. In a vacuum, it doesn't seem all that impressive. Like, I, I looked at it and kind of thought, yeah, it's a good card. It could work in the, the Jeskai list and some of those things, but it didn't strike me how powerful it could be until you started talking about it. I was like, oh... You well, got imagine, me there. That's good. <laughs> yeah, I mean, well, imagine you got two gold spans and you galvanic iteration this thing. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you know, okay. Well, now I got four more mana on the board <laughs> when my gold spans come back. So yeah. thanks. Hundred percent. Yeah, dude. It's it's a sick card. Uh, really cool art too. Um, yeah, I really love the art of it. Uh, I will say my favorite card for blue. Uh, I actually have a love hate relationship with this card. <laughs> If I may say so, because I think it's really good and really bad at the same time. Uh, it's Cut Your Losses, which is the new sorcery for four and two blue. Uh, I'm going to actually read the main text first. So it says target player mills half of their library rounded down. 
This is an effect we've seen plenty of times before at five mana uh, with things like Traumatize um, that literally say that, and that's it. Uh, but this features Casualty 2. Uh, now, Casualty 2 says, as you cast this spell, you may sacrifice a creature with power 2 or greater. When you do, copy this spell, and you may choose a new target for the copy. Here's my thing. <laughs> that That's a Law of Diminishing Returns example like no other, because the reality is, on the face... I first read this, I was like, oh, you could just mill somebody out with it. My dumbass was like, yeah, you just casualty it, and you win. Easy. That's not how it works. Yeah. I'm stupid. What it actually does is mill half of the half, just to clarify. So it's not going to mill somebody out. It can get pretty aggressive and obviously mill over half of the deck if you do use the casualty um, in the grand total. Uh, but truthfully, I actually think where this is better than anywhere else is uh, in things like Commander, where you've got a multiplayer mm -hmm. format, so you've got multiple people to hit, and you can get basically a full library worth of cards out of the game um now i will say what i do think is kind of fun about this card is there are a lot of copy spells in standard right now and anything that says do half of something is potentially a viable card to break right now uh because there is a possibility of being able to to just copy this and mill the other half pretty easily uh we've got plenty of examples of doing that with the mill deck currently uh I will say this is a bit of an expensive one to do that kind of thing with, but we do have gold span dragons, so you can treasure it out. Somebody's gonna try it, man. Oh, somebody I'm gonna try it. What gonna do you mean, try somebody? It. <laughs> Somebody's definitely taking it in. Is it mill? And I absolutely hate mill. I hate mill. I love mill. <laughs> but I mean, with the way mill is built, you're absolutely right. I mean, you got the dual strikes, you got the galvanic iterations, and you got the gold spans, and now, you know. A, a, We've got other cards that I wasn't necessarily going to talk in here, but um, what was it? Big Score, which is the new better version of Unexpected Windfall. Yeah. Um, which, I mean, yeah, man. Red and blue are getting so powerful, but they're going to have to because I still think Mono White's the one to beat. I agree. Yeah, 100%. But yeah, this card, somebody's going to do it, and I'm just going to sit there and shake my head when it happens. I hope I get the opportunity to do it to you first. <laughs> Thanks. That would make me really happy. Um, I also sidebar again. I'm a I'm a lover of the art of MTG quite a bit. I do love the mm -hmm. art on this card. I think it's really cool. So it was man. That was the one thing. Even though I was reading this card and absolutely projecting all the hate I could possibly could on it, uh, the artwork <laughs> is absolutely phenomenal. It's really man. sick. Yeah, hundred um, percent. All right, let's move on to black. And for okay. the first time ever, you picked a rare. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. So my idea with black, man, is that I just don't play a lot of mono black. I don't. Um, and mono black control is pretty prevalent right now. Um, and it probably even get more so. Uh, I don't think black gained a whole lot this time on its own. But uh, look, man, um, the... Uh, what is it? I can't even think of him right now. The three cost drops a token, sacrifice a creature. Help me out. Skullport Merchant. Oh, Skullport, Skullport Merchant. Yeah, definitely. I think with Dockside Chef taking up a slot now, mm -hmm. I think you could remove Dockside or you could remove Skullport. And I mean, man, if you're dropping in a 6 4, <laughs> yeah. It, on turn three, um, meat hooks are out of the way for a while. Yeah. Uh, their board wipes usually cost more unless they're running white and they can get a doom scar out. They got to have rely on spot removal. This thing has menace. Yeah. Um, and if it attacks, then they can, you know, they can have you draw a card. And then if so, you, you just untap the shake down heavy because that's what he is, man. He's shaking, shaking down your opponent. And uh, I think the possibility off the card draw off of this, as well as the damage output from the six, four, um, I think it, finally outweighs a little bit for that three spot i um yeah i i actually really agree with you i'm curious on this card because this is one of those that could be i think very very good or it could find its way into a place where it's just not quite as powerful as you want it to be but mm -hmm. what i will say is to your point this does everything that you want it to do and what the mono black does mono black deck does kind of already which is incorporate very difficult to deal with threats 
Uh, it gets ahead of opposing Meat Hook Massacres, as you pointed out, and it draws mm -hmm. cards, which is something that we love to see off of things like Skullport Merchant and Lolf and uh, even Soren, but yeah. it kind of does it all in one little three drop, and that's kind of the craziness of it. Now, it's all conditional is the trick, um, right. and as you said, you know, you do have to have spot removal, which is somewhat prevalent, but... Um, I will say, you know, as you mentioned, it gets out from under so many different things that I feel like it's worth it to give this one a shot and see how it works. Because, uh, I, I mean, you can't you can't ignore a giant six four menace <laughs> no, on <man>. turn three. <laughs> well, in Skullport, to draw the cards, you got to sack a creature or a treasure token. Yeah. You got to tap your mirror. <laughs> this guy is telling your opponent to decide what they want to do. They want to yeah. take six to the face. So they want to let you draw your card. And mono black control is in. I really think the swing position in mono black uh, control, mono black aggro, mid range, whatever you want to call it, is the is the three slot because yeah. your five slots filled by loth and invoke despair and yep. even Junji sometimes. <laughs> if you go as high as six, that's Onyx usually, or and then you got your snow. yeah, or your blood on the snow for the recursions, and then and then you've got your eye twitches and your shambling gas, and you play out your game plan. Yeah. just as normal so i mean i think it's i think your i think your three slot is now a choice between this skull port or the fell stinger yeah. and i think this fits in better than fell stinger and skull port both because fell stinger is doing the damage and this is constantly causing your opponent some grief they've 100%. either got to take the six or they're going to have to let you draw and even if they don't take the six or it, maybe they don't want you to draw you're still swinging in with menace. They gotta, yeah. they gotta put up two blockers. Maybe you're, maybe you're wiping out their threats towards you. So, uh, yeah, man, I really liked it when I saw it. And plus, I mean, it just fit the shakedown heavy. And <laughs> I mean, look, <laughs> look at him, man. He's yeah. just, he's just absolutely wrecking it. So I, I look forward to trying this one out. I think this guy is going to cause a lot of people grief. I definitely agree. Um, speaking of grief, uh, we'll mm -hmm. move on to my pick, which is Shadow yeah. of Mortality. This is an interesting one for multiple reasons, but let me talk through this really quick. It is a 7-7. Seven, seven. Now, when I say the mana cost, please please stay in your seats. It's, a, <laughs> it's 13 and 2 black. This is a 15 mana 7-7. Seven, seven. Uh, creature Avatar, if your life total is less than your starting life total, the spell costs X less to cast, where X is the difference. So it's not actually a 15 mana spell. Uh, here's the thing. We see, uh, and I'm keeping in mind Eternal formats more for this card, but I do think there is some shell where you could probably make this work in standard. Whether it's good or not, negligible. I have no idea. However, the important thing is we have the Death Shadow deck in things like Modern, uh, and even in, in like older formats we see Death Shadow occasionally. This is a strictly worse Death Shadow, in my opinion. There's not really a, an argument there. But there is one <laughs> thing that this is significantly better at in Modern, which is getting around all the stupid removal that Modern has right now. Modern has Fatal Push and it has Prismatic Ending as the two biggest pieces of removal and Lightning Bolt, uh, one mana removal or super cheap removal that removes a single target. This gets around all of it. This cannot be killed by some of the most prevalent spells in modern right now and i'm very curious if the death shadow deck starts running some number of these it's not going to replace death shadow obviously and that deck is a really tight knit knit deck so i'm curious to see how that works but i do think there's a world where you start running some of these just to get out from under some of the removal that you see in modern um i have no idea though this is all speculation this is my hope <laughs> No, man, I absolutely love it. Uh, look, I saw you selected it. I kind of laughed because I was like, man, people are not going to, they're not, <laughs> they're not going to listen. They're going to stop nope. listening as soon as, it 100%. Is, as soon as you say 15. Yeah. <laughs> um, look, I, I love it. I do. Um, and you can talk more about the modern side and all of that. Um, for the commander side, I don't really see it. And standard, I mean, yeah, man, it's definitely something I'm going to have to take out and give it a spin because. Yeah. It's stupid. It's so stupid. That's it's a common a theme with the picks that I have had. <laughs> yeah. But it's, it. look, I'll be honest. I mean, it's gone to Vanishing Verse. 
it's gone to Belfel Mastery. It's yeah. it's gone to Void Rain, which is coming out. Yeah. Um, however, in a Demir control deck, and you use slip out the back yeah. <laughs> with it, then it becomes an eight eight when it phases out. Look and at it comes that back little in. combo. That's awesome. And then, and then they're just you know they're having to constantly try and remove it and take yeah. it out. I think I think it fit if it was to fit in standard. I think it's got to fit within a controlled a Demir control build. Um, in a mono black build, yeah, I mean you could if you were going to do that. I would definitely do the meat hooks and yeah. well. Um, the meat hooks, uh, the fell stingers to do some damage to yourself, uh, trying to get some card draw and stuff. Um, but yeah, it's definitely going to be reliant on you being able to manage your life total throughout your match to to make it anywhere in standard. And I don't know that it's got a great fit, but I see it more in a Demir build. I, yeah, I think it would require a brand new build. Like, I don't think it just slots into any current decks that we have in standard. I will say, you know, as you pointed out, you do have to be really in control of your life total, but mm -hmm. um, fitting into a control deck is just the late game threat. Doesn't seem that bad to me. Now, I know it's there are better, like harder to deal with threats in standard right now. A lot of the ward creatures kind of come to mind in black. Um, and all of those are really good and probably better suited for the decks that we have right now. But the potential to like throw this down for basically a, a negligible amount of mana late game is pretty incredible. Uh, when you think of you know what you normally have to pay for a, a seven seven threat, and so while no, I don't think this is necessarily going to make huge waves in standard or be anything super incredible. I am very curious to see how this plays out, and um, it is certainly a card that, as you said, we're going to have to take out and see how it does. But uh, yeah, I should mention also at this point, uh, this is pretty pretty obvious, but uh, we're picking cards for different reasons for this list. <laughs> um, it doesn't necessarily mean it's competitively viable. We're just doing right. these as like cards that stuck out to us. Uh, and it might be that they are competitively viable. Obviously, one of us took it more seriously than the other. Um, I don't know what you're talking about. Yeah, right. Uh, but uh, regardless, I, I do think this is going to be a fun one, so I'm excited. Yeah, and definitely before we switch up colors, which just sounds like what you're segueing into here. Um, nice pickup. A plus on the artwork on that card, man. Dude, I love oh, it. 100%. So I love sick. it, man. Yeah. Love it. I think I'm going to alter that one at some point. Oh, that'd be nice to see. Yeah. Man, maybe drop the hand down a little bit and have yeah. the guy hanging over the text or yeah, something. Dude, 100%. Yeah, dude. Yeah, the artwork is just absolutely phenomenal. Yeah. I haven't touched altars yet from this set, but I'm thinking that might happen this week. So we'll see. That'd be a sweet one. Yeah. Can't wait. Can't For wait. Sure. Well, as you so eloquently picked up on, yes, let's move on to <laughs> uh, to red. What'd you pick there? So for red, it's another uh, common. It is a one drop enchantment or um, I was going to do the um, big score. However, I think everybody knows that one's coming out, and that's yeah. the Unexpected Windfall, the new version that only costs one red instead of two red. Uh, Strictly same, better. Yeah, same card, though, same card. So, yeah. great. Now now people are going to have four copies of Unexpected Windfall. <laughs> so, to go along with that theme, and kind of with my pick from Blue as well, is Sticky Fingers, the Enchantment Aura. So, this is a one red enchant creature. Enchanted creature has Menace. And whenever this creature deals combat damage to a player, create a treasure token. So whenever enchanted creature dies, you get to draw a card. Man, tell me this isn't going on every gold span that hits the board <laughs> under my control. <laughs> so. so here's my thing, though, because I do want to bring mm -hmm. this up because I I mean, the effects are perfect for a gold span dragon, obviously. Mm -hmm. Here's my question to you. Do you think this also has room in a... I'm I'm gonna be slightly vague here, but a more like low ground, pure aggro red deck um, that is looking to play cheaper guys and then be able to kind of capitalize on them long term. Do you feel like this is a card that slots in there? Because that actually is what struck me first. Yeah. So I mean, yeah. Just to go off of that, I mean, the card. Look, the card I selected was for that specific reason. However, the reason I really like this card and it became my selection is 
I think this fits in a lot of things. Yeah. Who doesn't want to create treasure tokens? All of a sudden, I mean, other than the fact that you can't double up a treasure token's mana, but now everything you run is a gold span except for that. Yeah. You know, and now it's just going to start. Now it's just going to start uh, creating treasure tokens for you. So, yeah, I think it fits in a lot of things. I, I, yeah. I mean, you can keep it low to the ground. You can put it in the air. The air is probably where you're going to get the most value out of it because, of, you know, you're more likely to hit your opponent with it. Um, however, you know, throw it throw it on an Alvinwald oddity with trample yeah. <laughs> you know yeah. i mean just flip that the thing yeah and i mean i'll be damned give mono or give give gruel more more mana that's what they need <laughs> <laughs> I, was I was honestly I, thinking too like the the is it delver style decks and yeah. i know i mentioned delver a lot but delver is a great example of a card that i feel like early on could start capitalizing on this and then even yeah. if it does die it's going to replace itself and it's fine um mm -hmm. and that deck generally tries to draw a lot of extra cards with like suspicious stowaway right now and things like that and so that extra treasure token has a place to go it's not just a um you know a, a situation where you you hold on to the treasure for some big thing like you can start utilizing it right away um yeah. and using something like you see a guard coming or uh <clears throat> any kind of you know protection spell you can use it like you attach this to your delver you get the treasure token and then you can use that immediately and so you get a very small window for the opponent where they can actually deal with things but other than that it makes it really tricky for them to do so yeah well and it's a two for one is what i like for it too i mean yeah. if you if by chance you get through and you get the damage and you get the treasure token if that creature ends up getting removed which is what your opponents are going to do that's how magic's played yep. you're going to get to draw a card so it's an opt without the scries for sure uh, great pick. I think that's a really interesting one, though. Um, Thank you. I also picked an enchantment on the other end of the <laughs> spectrum. <laughs> Again, jank, everybody. <laughs> uh, we went with Arcane Bombardment, <laughs> which is an absolutely ridiculous card. This is... I, I, I don't have a lot to talk about with this. This is pure jank, like 100%. Four and two red for an enchantment. Whenever you cast your first instant or sorcery spell each turn... Exile an instant or sorcery card at random from your graveyard, then copy each card exiled with Arcane Bombardment. You may cast any number of the copies without paying their mana cost. Here's the thing. <laughs> Here's the thing that di I didn't catch it first. So in my uh -huh. mind, I was just like, you, you exile one thing, you get to play it. You're going to start playing that card every single turn because you just add a, another card to the stack. So yeah. like... I don't know where this goes, to be honest. Any Spells Matters commander deck is going to love it. But, like, mm -hmm. it's just stupid. This is like one... Okay, here's what it reminds me of. Not because of what it does, but it reminds me of cards like uh, the Songbird's Invocation card and the uh, Thousand Year Storm stuff and even stuff like Mirror March, which obviously doesn't deal with instants and sorceries, but is just purely silly, like, over-the-top win. That's what this feels like to me. It takes a little longer to get going, but I love it, and I 100% am building multiple decks with this stupid thing, and I'm going <laughs> to try and make it work. It's so silly. It's ridiculous. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think with, uh, and again, man, my mind's always going to go back to this because I'm always thinking about how to ramp up into the bigger spells when I think about jank. So, so your mana is crucial in, in jank builds with bigger spells. So I think back to big score and unexpected windfall and the galvanic iterations and stuff. Yeah. OAL this thing is just going to cast them over and over and over and over <laughs> again for you. <laughs> I mean, Seems good. I, I'm actually going to be a really horrible magic content creator right here. I have not done all my research on streets of new Capena yet. I was, I was actually, I've got time set aside for this weekend to go through and read all the cards. And when you selected this and it popped up, um, what you missed the first time yeah i caught the first time yeah <laughs> it was like it broke my brain <laughs> <laughs> i was like oh all the stuff i can do i don't even know it was it's it was crazy absolutely ridiculous and i love it for no other reason than it's a stupid card yeah i That's literally felt like jim carrey and batman with just all the power and knowledge <laughs> coming down it was just I like oh, it. i don't even know what to do so. i love that now uh <laughs> yeah. 
yeah, with that silliness out of the way, we'll move on to green. Uh, we did have a similar pick here, so I'm going to let you s choose the other one, uh, if you know what I'm saying, and I'll I'll keep my pick, because you technically threw two into the, the option here. Oh, okay. Um, so... Because I'm going to talk about your other one anyway. Do you want me to talk about my other one? I'll talk about my other one and then you can, you can, yeah, I mean, you works. can always venture into it and then you can go ahead and explain the one that we both picked. Yeah. So the reason, look, the one that we both picked was just too good not to pick. Uh, that's coming up. That, <laughs> that one's definitely coming up. However, I've got this deck list, a little plug here. It resolves, just put out a video on it as well. And yes. it is uh, the perfect storm. Uh, sorry, perfect swarm. And it's got scoot swarms and it's got marauding blight priest and it's got Dina and it's got prosperous innkeeper. So you're doing a bunch of life gain and drain and landfalls and you've got meat hooks that you can uh, kill with. So for my pick is social climber, two colorless, one green. Whenever another creature enters the battlefield under your control, you gain a life. And it's a 3-2. So it's just an addition to a deck that I'd already built that needed a little bit more life gain kicking off just to do its thing a little bit quicker. And I think it fits really, really well in a Golgari uh, drain and gain uh, deck list like that. I I have nothing to add, but 100% agree. To me, it's just like a... I, I think a slightly worse Prosperous Innkeeper if mm -hmm. I had to compare the two. No, um, definitely. It doesn't come in with a treasure token. It also costs one mana more. The upside, of course, is the power toughness boost, which is certainly some semi-relevant. Um, but it dies to a lot of the same stuff. And so to me, this is just an extra copy if you want that life gain. It allows you to be a little more heavy in the green side of things if you want to be and still run essentially extra copies. So, um, yeah, I'm super cool with it. I love it. Great absolutely absolutely thank you thank you but the reason i did pick that was because of our combined pick yeah so uh let me pull it up here we have got i think just a ridiculous card it um, is man it's stupid yeah this card is insane so we have gala greeters uh which is a one one for one at a green note that it's the same cost as a prosperous innkeeper with the same power and toughness because that's semi-relevant uh also features alliance let me also say this is an elf, which does have implications in uh, some eternal formats. I'm not going to say it's great, but it is something to think <laughs> about. Um, I think there are better options there, but it is an elf. Whenever another oh. creature enters the battlefield under your control, choose one that hasn't been chosen this turn. So you can only do one of each of these once each turn. Put a 1-1 one -one counter on Gallagreeters, so you can start buffing it up. Create a tapped treasure token. Uh, crucial that it's tapped, but still, and you gain two life. So, like, did you ever have a prosperous innkeeper in which you could make <laughs> more treasure tokens? Right. Did you ever wish it was a little stronger? Right. I get that this has a cap on the amount of life that you can gain, but my assumption is if you're running this, you're probably also running prosperous innkeeper. It's, like, in a similar vein, so you could probably just, again, basically run extra copies this is just stupidly good like you, you it does everything you want in green <laughs> like i love it yeah man no i do i agree 100 percent, man and when i saw this card i was like what yeah. <laughs> so uh first of all um i hope he's at a rave and that's just like the black light that's hitting his face <laughs> why is he blue um second of all uh take note like prosperous innkeeper it's a non-legendary creature you can have multiples yeah. of these on the field. Multiples. Well, and picture this for just a second. Picture this scenario, because this did come up in my thought process for this card. You got this guy down. Fantastic. You have a Scoot Swarm down. Even better. Mm -hmm. On your opponent's turn, you crack your Evolving Wilds to trigger your Scoot Swarm, to trigger this little stupid thing multiple times, and you get all of it on the opponent's turn <laughs> so yeah. in response to a meat hook massacre you get it out of range of the meat hook massacre like it's it's insane the possibilities with this little guy i think it's it's a it's an incredible card just all around fantastic 
Yeah, no, man, I love it. I love it. And there will be multiples and it will fit in the scoot deck that uh, the Golgari scoot deck that I play. And that was the only reason I, I even selected Social Climber was because we had both yeah. selected Gala Greeters and I was just showing as another uh, alternate uh, life gain ability off of a green card. And I mean, Gala Greeters does the same thing. So yeah, um, Social Climber will probably not make it into the deck but it was another one and it's an uncommon if you don't have the wild yeah. cards to spend for it for the rares and stuff nice but if you option. do yeah if you do though gala greeters man the way to go 100 percent, dude, dude. dude that, it's so sick that weird blue guy is going and why does he look like a bounty hunter from star wars <laughs> <I> mean, <laughs> on that note we're moving out of monocolored stuff, guys. So we are moving into what really was a difficult choice for me, uh, but the multicolored side of things. That's why my honorable mention was multicolored. There's so much here, guys. This is going to be a tough one um, because there just is so much with the, the tricolored thing. Um, however, I think you picked one that I was actually also looking at uh, mm -hmm. and also got an early spoiler. So I'm kind of curious your thoughts here. Uh, what'd you pick, bud? It was an oil, uh, an early spoiler, and uh, it's banned. Broker's ascendancy. Yeah, dude. Um, look, as soon as this thing hit the spoiler list, and I read it and saw it, I was like, you know, as much as I hate to say this, or even put the thought in anybody's head. Tell me Barrent Ruins doesn't possibly become viable. Yeah. And instead of giving your creatures haste off of red, you can give your creatures flying. Yeah which helps out a lot with the aggro getting through depending on what you know the tempo is in your game with your opponent so i think it really fit and plus i mean bamp party may be viable again i don't know dude i miss the bamp party decks they're they're kind of fun i think yeah well i mean i wouldn't have i'm not a huge fan of any type of aggro <laughs> but fair enough <laughs> but but i mean it really does and i mean uh let's face it um the emperor is going to be around for a while yeah, she just is. And when all these other amazing planeswalkers we have right now, I still think Loth is the strongest we've got. But I think Emperor is going to be around for a while and she fits right into this color scheme. And, uh, you know, at the beginning of your end step, you get to put a plus one plus one counter on each creature you control and a loyalty counter on each planeswalker you control. Now, Emperor may be the only planeswalker you're running in this. But if you get to add the Emperor into a Bant Ruins deck. Yeah. And you're getting the card draw like crazy. Um, yeah, I think this is actually, I mean, me personally, the first thing I would probably try with this is Bant Ruins. However, I think it fits in Bant Party really nicely as well. I think it works great in Scoot's form. Um, so, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, Dude, that too. <laughs> honestly, it does. That's all I'm saying. Um, I weirdly, like the the thing that did come to mind when we were going through these lists was the the gala whatever that we just talked about plus Scoot Swarm plus this. Like there's a Bant shell for that now, in my opinion. Um mm -hmm. that might include the Wanderer, but I think uh there there's a lot of possibility with a card like this and it's it's insane. Um but oh, just yeah. any modified thing, like throwing Kodama in there with this, like now all of a sudden you've got tons of modified creatures that also have trample, that also can get you lands, that ramp you into Vorinclex, that let Did you go crazy. Not even think about it. I got man, we gotta wrap up, dude. I gotta go write you gotta some go stuff deck down. Build. I gotta go uh, write some stuff down. I love and it. I mean, honestly, put in put in a Ren and Seven. Um, hey, yeah. have you ever got an ultimate on Ren and Seven? Because it's amazing. It's insane, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's so amazing. stupidly good. Um, I'm going to move on to mine because mine will yeah. take just a few minutes just to read. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I actually picked a Planeswalker and not the one I was actually thinking I was going to pick for this list, but I did take uh, Obnixilus the Adversary as my go-to here. Now, I, hear me out because I know this is a bit of an odd pick, potentially. Uh, it's one, a black, and a red for a three-loyalty Planeswalker. Crucially, that's point A. It's three mana, three loyalty, which is like the going rate for... Uh, your your planeswalkers that are gonna be viable nowadays, in my opinion. Um, it does feature casualty. So casualty X. The copy isn't legendary and has a starting loyalty of X. So with this, you have the ability to actually get a second Obnixilus on the field in the same turn. Uh, now again, when you sacrifice, you have to sacrifice a creature with power X, and then you get a loyalty Obnixilus equal to that. Uh, 
So let's run through the abilities. Plus one, each opponent loses two life unless they discard a card. If you control a demon or devil, you actually gain two life as well. Uh, first and foremost, this is life gain in a devil slash demon deck is like super out of the ordinary, but I really like it. I think it mitigates a lot of the general life loss that you tend to take from your own cards out of those style decks. And so I'm kind of curious to see how that works out. Uh, it has the classic protect itself minus two ability. In this case, create a one, one red devil creature token with when this creature dies, it deals one damage to any target. While I don't think that's going to trade up most of the time, it does offer a lot of flexibility. Uh, and what I mean by that is it can trade up to a 2-2 or any kind of two toughness creature. It can also hit a Planeswalker. Uh, so if they, you know, play the Wanderer out and uh, or the Wandering Emperor out minus two on something of yours, and then you throw this out, get the 1-1 Devil. So if you If they're at one loyalty, you can deal with it. Uh, which is really useful. It also deals one last point of damage to the opponent if you need it to. Uh, finally, the minus seven is Grizzlebrand. Heck freaking yes. Dra target player draws seven cards and loses seven life. That's the Grizzlebrand ability. And here's the deal. This is a bit of a pipe dream, I know. But I picture this... <laughs> I don't necessarily picture this coming out on turn three all the time. I, fig I figure this could be... I will say this, it's flexible. It works as a three three mana planeswalker on its own. If you can casualty out a second version, it's that much better because very rarely are people able to deal with multiple planeswalkers in a single turn, especially that early in the game. There are ways to do it, but it's very challenging. Late game though, you sacrifice a really big creature to this and you just draw as much as you want. <laughs> like you're able on the casualty side on the the token side, you get to draw seven cards. Yeah, you lose seven life, but in the right shell, I feel like there's a world where you get to do so much with this. The turn it comes out that is insane. Uh, so yeah, he's my pick. I also just like Jund, and I feel like this might work really well in Jund. So that's okay. my thing. So hear me out. <laughs> yeah, dude, go for it. I am not. A huge Obnixilus fan. Oh, however, I hate him as a character. Yeah, how, well, I mean, even a lot of his cards, I'm just not yeah. a huge fan with them. I usually find other stuff that I can utilize and pick that I like better. However, um, I think people are a little bit down on this card a little more so than they should be because um, you could turn for him after you turn three a shakedown heavy and your casualty comes in with six loyalty. Yes. Or you could hold him for a storm the festival, and you've already got a rent out with a seven seven tree folk, and you're gonna ultimate one the the copy as soon as it comes out. That's my thing. It seems yeah. really good. Yeah, man. I think people are a little too down on Obnixilus, and don't forget this man has dressed to the nines for the yes, party. Dude. He is. He is the boss that he's supposed to be in this picture, man. The yeah. pinstripe suit, you know, I mean, the hand up. I mean, yeah. Dude, it's beautiful. You can't, this artwork, yeah, probably one of, if not my favorite in the yeah. set. I think it's uh, up there. As... It's just absolutely, it's stunning, man. Stunning. Yeah, I think it's up there as one of my favorites. I honestly, uh, I see this in like a Vorin Klex Jund Super Friends style build or something along those lines where you can create a bunch of tokens, use those to casualty out something that you need to and like capitalize on, on counters in some way. So I don't have a build for this yet, but this is certainly a card that I'm going to be building around. I think it's so sick. Yeah, it. well, and I just, I, I just yeah. honestly, I mean, to anybody that has been down on the car, which I have, I've heard people vocalize yeah, about definitely. it. It's just, just horrible this turnaround. Hey, man, don't put him out. Don't put the, don't no. put, don't put a three cost planeswalker out yet. No. Uh, you don't absolutely have to run a four, four copies of it. You don't absolutely have to get it on turn three. And it, like I said, you cheated out with the storm, the festival, and you got the right stuff on the board, and you're about to just destroy the game. Hundred percent so, agree. I think it's going to be yeah. sick. He um, is, man. He's got potential. 100%. All right, dude. We made it through all the colored stuff. Let's go yeah. into uh, to artifacts really quick, and then we'll have lands, and then we'll we'll uh, wrap yeah. this one up, dude. Yeah, artifacts. <laughs> I love your pick. Oh, my gosh, man. Why did I not get your artifact? I can't see did your you artifact. Did you not? Oh, no. No, I didn't. Okay. Um, I'll walk you through it. Don't worry about it. Okay. Well, and I've got, I've got I think I've got Scryfall. 
shameless plug to Scryfall right there. Scryfall um, is the best magic website, I'm convinced. If anybody yeah. does it, they're not a sponsor, but if they want to be, that'd be great. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, no doubt, no doubt. Okay, so look, I'm going to get to, I'll, I'll quit messing with Scryfall right this second, and we'll get to my uh, <laughs> artifacts pick here. So my artifacts pick is purely for the jank of it. Yes. This is this is Arc Spitter. It is a one colorless drop artifact equipment, uncommon. Equip creature has pay one, and this creature deals one damage to target creature that's blocking it. It's equipped one cost. So you can pay one to get it on the board. You can equip it for one, that's two. And then when that creature attacks in, you can pay one and deal one damage to a target creature that's blocking it. Dude, if this thing is not going in a Scoot Swarm Serith deck and everything's got Death Touch and I'm going to kill your entire board, <laughs> I mean, I love I'm it. telling you, man, this thing is... Look, if you haven't ever run into the Thornbite staff in Commander and gotten shot by poison uh, Death Touch creatures with something, then uh, you're missing out, man. The only trick with this, because I... I saw this and was like, oh, that's super broken. You can jank that out 100%. Mm -hmm. The only trick is the creature that you're using or that you're damaging has to be blocking the creature that's equipped. Right. And that makes it tricky. I think there's still combos yeah. there, though. Definitely. Well, I mean, if, again, you drop a you drop a Ren on the board and you got a Tree Folk that's got to be blocked. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you can make it where it's going to the creature that you know they're going to block. Oh, yeah, 100%. And if not, then they're just going to get smashed for all that damage. Well, and I actually think this sets up like a really silly kitchen table style deck where mm -hmm. the, as you said, like you give something death touch and all that stuff. But there are creatures that literally, now this hasn't happened in a long time that I'm aware of, but there right. are creatures that have the ability that says like all creatures able to block this creature have to. Yeah, you put yeah. this on that with Death Touch, <laughs> and now, I mean, you're good to go. Uh, and so I do think there are some like very cool like fringe builds that'll love this. I'm curious mm -hmm. to see how it works if it actually like turns into anything too crazy, but uh, I do really like it. I think it's a it's a jank a jank card, hundred percent. Oh yeah, man, no no doubt. It's and it's just purely for the fun of it. But yeah. I mean, you know. I think Arc Spitter and Scoot Swarms and Sarath and maybe a Wren and Ovenwald Oddity, maybe Glorious Sunrise for the trample across the board if you don't have enough to put in Ovenwald Oddity. Yeah. But I swear, I am wiping somebody's board with Spinning Wheel Kick this season. Oh, heck yes. <laughs> so it's That's going such to a happen. good idea. <laughs> it is going to happen. Yeah. I love so. it, dude. That's so sick. All right. That's All right. enough. That's my jank right there. So I'm... I pick this card for the simple potential of it. I don't have a build for it, but I feel like this is a, a card that has so much just really interesting stuff around it. So this is Luxior Giada's Gift. I hope I'm saying that correctly. I may not be. It's a one mana legendary artifact equipment. Interesting, we both chose equipments. Uh, equip creature gets plus one, plus one for each counter on it. Uh, the equip permanent isn't a planeswalker and is a creature in addition to its other types loyalty abilities can still be activated now it has a normal equip cost of three that's for any creature that you want to equip it to however for the first time ever you can equip this to a planeswalker uh for only one mana which is kind of ridiculous so again this is a situation where like the that Jund Super Friends kind of build that I, mm -hmm. I kind of alluded to with Obnixilis. I feel like this is a card in there where you might want to do this and like have an out for playing this. Um, the fact that it's so cheap for Planeswalkers is ridiculous to me. The fact that it's a new ability is kind of awesome. And again, think about the scenario late game where you casualty out a really powerful Obnixilis and just equip it up with this <laughs> and like... Now, all of a sudden, you've just got, you replaced your big creature with the same power toughness, but it also has a Planeswalker ability on top of it. Um, and it's untapped because you can't attack with it the first turn. So I don't know. I feel like there's some potential here for some really interesting play patterns. I love this card. I think it's awesome. No, I absolutely agree, man. And I like where you're going with it. I mean, just the possibility of hitting a Vorinclex into yeah. a Ren and Seven. 
and then that dropping onto it, I mean, it would just be absolutely bonkers, man. And then, like of course, if you limit. said, like you, like you said, with the I don't don't forget about Kadama and the modified creatures with the yeah, plus one plus yeah, one yeah. counters. I mean, you'd have lands for days. All you got to do is get like a draw ability or a scry ability or do in search of greatness where you're just playing stuff for free or something like that. Yeah, man. I'm I seriously... just thought of something too. You can actually, if this gets in your graveyard with Tamio. Like, if mm -hmm. they kill it somehow, Tamiya lets token. you just bring it back. That's sick. Yep. Dude, yeah, this card's awesome. That's all. Yeah, saying. well, and it's a legendary, so if you're playing the Mirror Box Saltai version, and you bring it back yes! as a token, and you got Chariot, <laughs> yes! then you can just start making copies of your token. Oh, this uh, is why we need to gift. have this podcast, so we can figure out these ridiculous play hey, patterns. There's just absolutely stupid stuff to do, man. I, yeah, there just 100%. is and uh yeah um i like it man i do um am i going to be a fan of using it myself a lot probably not but there are definitely builds that i've got to try it in that i've got to try and hit yeah. the the jank yeah. and uh definitely looking forward to it it's a great addition to me it's also like a potential include so a lot of the stuff that we've been talking about with these kinds of cards are like build arounds and so this mm -hmm. is like a prevalent card in a planeswalker deck obviously but something you could also consider is like your esper control list or whatever if you happen to run planeswalkers towards the towards the the end of the game you throw one of these in your control deck and that's your finisher essentially mm -hmm. Um, and because, you know, they can kill as many planeswalkers as they want, you just have more planeswalkers that always, like with Blood on the Snow in particular, you just get to bring them back. Um, this is going to stick on the field regardless. And so unless they've got like a farewell or something in particular that's really going to deal with it, it's a little bit trickier. And so especially a best of one, I feel like you're going to sneak out a few wins with, with this just to be able to close out the game pretty quickly. Um, but all that to say, we now get to yeah. move on to lands. <laughs> And we picked the same thing. Surprise, it's to. the Triumphs. <laughs> <laughs> Who would have thought? Uh, they're good. I don't know. Play them. Like, I don't know what to say about yeah. these. They're just the obvious choice. Well, I mean, look, it's... <laughs> I don't know how many people are new here as to how many have been playing for a while as to what you've seen with triomes yeah um especially like the teamer reclamation decks and uh if you're playing a green deck that can get enough lands on the field as quickly as possible well one you're mana fixing at three colors yeah and you can also search up a plains a forest or a mountain off of just like jet mirrors and so the land is targeted and named to where you can go depending on what card you're using to uh, tutor a land it may give you the name yep. and as long as it doesn't say basic then you can go get it the other thing is is late game that cycling becomes huge so when you're falling flat off your top deck and being able to cycle on your opponent's turn to draw a card to draw into another card to get through that flood or that drought that you're in yeah. uh you shouldn't be in a drought if you're cycling your trial no. but <laughs> uh that, that cycle ability just becomes absolutely huge late game uh it's way too much to pass up and the fact that esper's got one uh yeah there'd be a four of yeah, hundred percent. My yeah. So you nailed it on the head. To to sum that up, um, the ability, the flexibility of lands is something that is always like super highly valued. Um, it's crazy to me because people, especially new players, have a tendency to undervalue uh, particular lands, whether that be tech lands or dual lands or in this case tri lands. Um, and it's really easy to do that, right? Because you want to get the big powerful spell in your deck. You don't care about the lands, right? Like they're not winning you the game. Well, you can't play that big powerful spell yeah. unless you yeah. got lands. So um, I, I would say, you know, if you're a seasoned player or if you've been around in standard for just a little while at this point, you probably understand the value of these. But if you are a new player, do not sleep on the the tri lands or any any kind of tech or dual lands because... Uh, the flexibility that these in particular offer to any given deck that might be able to use them is extraordinarily important. And until you like really delve into the game, you may not see that, and that's okay. But a hundred percent, you got to try them out because they are they will be played in standard. They will be played other in other places as well. Um, mm -hmm. They're just good. There, there's no way around it. 
Yeah, look, uh, I will never tell anybody to spend a wild card on anything. I never will. Yeah. yeah you got to play the game your style. You got to spend the wild cards on whatever you want. However, and I still won't say spend your wild cards. <laughs> I will <laughs> spend your wild but, uh, cards. These things are going to be around for years to come, and they're just now coming in. And they're going to cross over to other formats for you as well. So yep. I'm still not going to tell you to spend your wild cards, but uh, I mean, a wise investment is a wise investment if you ever yeah. want to try run a three colored uh, deck. 100%. And you can even see that in the value of the current, uh, the previous triumphs that um, mm -hmm. we had in, was it Akoria? Yeah, it was Akoria. Well, yeah, it was Akoria. <laughs> um, the, the previous ones have held their value even outside of standard. So there's yeah. there's plenty of uh, value and, and flexibility there. Uh, but with that, mm -hmm. we conclude our list. We did it. This was our yeah. first podcast episode. I but know. That was amazing. Um, it was. We're a little... Uh, what we're going to do, uh, and, and I think this will be a reoccurring theme, is as our outro, we'll, we'll each share something non-magic related that uh <laughs> we're either really happy about or really sad about or really mad about uh now i will say if you have had all the magic content you want to have and that's it great we thank you so much for listening this is more for us to to enjoy the uh the moment and enjoy the episode a little bit uh just to have some fun so country fried tell me something yeah. that uh that happened to you this week man well, it's not something that's actually happened to me yet. It's getting ready to happen. Okay. And uh, I, I thought it fell in line perfectly with, you know, you're not necessarily a newlywed. I mean, you are. It was October. So, yes, you yeah. really are. Uh, <laughs> you just took your honeymoon and everything. However, we have an event coming up in the household. Uh, the last of the six is in her junior year, going into her senior year. And this weekend is prom. <laughs> Oh man. <laughs> so, <laughs> there's fingernails, there's hair, yeah. there's clothes, there's the dress, there's after prom clothes, there's you know, transportation, there's after prom party food, there's adult supervision. There I mean, man, it just goes on and on. Look, um to anybody that has done this or to anybody that's got kids or doesn't have kids but may potentially and getting ready to do this uh be in the moment man it really is a lot of fun i mean i say it is a lot and i want to give grief because she's the baby but um it is her big moment to shine and uh she is having a blast with it so as much as i hate this being her first of two proms and next year will be her last uh that's what we got going on in the household man and i really dude i'm serious by next year all this is just going to be just straight gray yeah so <laughs> but no man, <laughs> it's a lot of fun i, I Hey, I've been to some myself when I was younger. I forgot all about it. But yeah, as the kids go through them, it's a lot of fun. But man, it's a hectic time here, dude. I feel for you, dude. Go, go, go. Yeah, I uh <laughs> I I mean I've been to a couple proms. We Caitlin and I do not have kids yet. And so thankfully that's nowhere near happening yet. But um that's one of those things that, you know, as you mentioned, we got married recently and all that stuff and Kids are, you know, we're talking about having kids in the future and all that, that, that conversation has come up. And that's one of the reasons where I'm like, I could just not and it'd be fine. <laughs> like, um, I know that sounds aggressive. I'm over dramatizing, but, uh, that, that kind of stuff is like, as a parent, that scares me a little bit. Yeah, no, man, you said it. I mean, it's no, it's, it's perfectly fine to think of it that way. And it really is, man, the way I've always put it, uh, to the kids and, the kids getting ready to have kids and um it i don't want to say it the wrong way i definitely don't want people to take it the wrong way but kids are your best and worst of moments yeah they're going to be your best of moments because you absolutely love them and they just shine for you and they make you proud they're your worst of moments because you will never feel so out of control <laughs> in your yeah. entire life yeah. as you'd be with your kids and you just want them to be safe and happy and yeah. that's just the way it goes dude i i think uh i mean having not had kids i don't know personally but i think uh that's just good life advice i think you just nailed it that's awesome oh thank you 
I um, try, man. And I charge $50 an hour. You guys can call me on my private line. Go yeah, ahead. there's a form at the end of the podcast. I'm going to need you to fill that out and pay. Um, right. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, so I'll uh, I'll share mine really quick. Um, so as you mentioned, as we talked about at the top of the episode, uh, I did just get back from Honeymoon. Um, while Caitlin and I did get married in October, uh, she she's a, a fourth grade school teacher. And so we don't have a lot of days during the school year that we're able to take. Thankfully, it was her spring break last week. And so we decided to drive down to the Florida Keys. Now, we're in South Carolina, um, the north side of South Carolina, just under Charlotte, North Carolina. Here's the thing. I, I'm going to lead off with the good because the whole week was amazing. Let me just say, like, we had amazing food. We got to eat at a beautiful little restaurant on, we were staying on Isla Mirada, uh, which is only like three or four islands into the Keys. Uh, we had a beautiful resort literally outside the window was our bar, along with mm-hmm. a saltwater pool. And like 20 feet from that was the ocean. So we were on the Atlantic Ocean side. We literally just got to sit on the beach all week. It was phenomenal. I, that experience was one of a kind and amazing. So we had a blast. But <laughs> <laughs> on the way back, we drove down. It took us 15 hours. That's a long time. And let me be clear, for reasons I'm not going to talk about, I had to drive the whole way. Um, I, It was a long drive. It was rough. Um, but we made it and it was fine. We were really stoked to get there. And so the adrenaline was, I think, really helping us out. So we, we got there pretty late the first night, went out, sat on the beach that evening just to enjoy it for a few minutes and then basically crashed because it was, it was a long day. On the day we left, I, because I'm a dumbass, woke up at 3 a.m. when we had planned to leave at 5 and I couldn't fall back asleep. So I laid in bed for an hour. Finally, Caitlin woke up and I was like, hey, let's just go because at this point I'm just wasting time. Like I'm going to crash later. So we're going to need to like start driving. Otherwise, it might happen while we're driving. And I don't think either of us (laughs) want that to happen. So we start driving and we get to the like 12, 13 hour mark. We're in Savannah, Georgia. We're only like three hours away. Well, we hit stopped traffic, complete standstill on 95 it reroutes us through Savannah, Georgia, like the literal town, downtown. So we were on the Savannah, like the massive bridge in Savannah. And it was standstill there as well. And we were getting a little pissy, if I can say that. <laughs> like we were starting to get a little aggravated at each other and at the situation. It was mostly at the situation, but obviously like I was really wanting to get home. Caitlin has an uncle who lives in Hilton Head who was kind enough to offer up their place as a way that we could split the drive a little bit for the evening. And so I had said, no, we're going to get through. We're going to get through. It's fine. Everything's fine. And then we hit standstill traffic on the bridge for like an hour. And I'm like, fuck it. Caitlin, can you please call your uncle? (laughs) Uh, And so she was kind enough to do so uh, with only one or two snarky comments, uh, which was well-deserved. And we ended up getting to Hilton Head and crashing there for the night. So aside from the drive, that was an amazing week. I'm very happy to say we had a blast on our honeymoon. It was an amazing time. Uh, Would love to go back, but I'm also excited to be here with you guys and with Country Fried and talking magic. So it it was a great experience. (laughs) Good, man. Good. I hope, man, I hope the slumber. (laughs) outside my house isn't coming through the microphone it is <laughs> but talk, it's fine no I'm just kidding. talk about timing <laughs> no, it's all good we're on wrap up man it's all I good i know i know yeah dude look i feel for you man um uh, i rode i rode fatigue like no other yeah um i cannot yeah i'm so bad at it that if it's if i'm pushing over two hours on the road uh yeah. we may want to re- we may want to start thinking about stops a long oh, man. way Dude, okay. I can't do it, man. I can't yeah. do it. I rose, I, and and it's you know it's road fatigue, and then it's the nitpicky and all yeah. that. And uh, and oddly enough, my wife and I just don't argue any time else. But man, you get us in a vehicle, yeah, <laughs> dude. Honestly, anybody with that amount of time, no, like, Caitlin and I are really good about being like really respectable even when we do have like if we have an argument we have an argument but we're pretty like rational about it it doesn't get heated it's nothing crazy we just try and work through it and it works great uh but man when you're in a car for 12 13 hours oh yeah man you're just done and like 
I don't care who you talk to, like you're gonna get frustrated. It has no nothing. Doubt. It's it's just pure like I need to get out of this car. <laughs> Bro, I, I, I feel for you, I do, man. Cause I would at three hours mark, I'd be like, Yeah. Are you gonna swallow that hard when you're drinking that drink? Yeah. Are you gonna be eating them Cheetos with your mouth open the whole bar? <laughs> no, I also uh and this is to my detriment, I um and I'm getting a little personal, but I pee a lot on car rides. <laughs> And I like chugged coffee because it was three in the morning. And so it was literally like every 20 minutes. I'm like, Caitlin, I need to, I need to go to the bathroom. <laughs> I I'm felt really bad. Feel, I'm going to make you feel even better. Oh, good. <laughs> we were going up to the Stanley hotel Yeah. in the mountains of Colorado one time. Yeah. And man, we were on, it was in the winter, so the roads were already horrible. And we were on a, we were on a mountain pass that had no pullover lanes, no nothing. <laughs> and my wife is the same way. Yeah. That has to be all the time. And yeah. drinks a lot of coffee in the morning. And man, there was nothing I could do. It literally came down to a bottle in the back seat. Yeah. <laughs> you just got to do your thing, babe. I, I had an emergency thing. cup just in case. I had my old coffee cup. I was like, I'm, this is the cup. If I need I mean, it, what, it's here. What, what, what's my options? Do I drive down the mountain for you? You yeah. want to just wink, <laughs> just send us right over the edge? Just hurry up. There is I nothing I can do. There is yeah. nothing I can do. Hundred <laughs> percent agree. You got to do it, man. Uh, and on that note, <laughs> uh, I hope we're my gonna. Wife doesn't see this. I love this. I hope she does. I hope Caitlin watches too. Uh, guys, I want to thank everybody here for uh, for hanging in there with us. I know this was a long first episode. This was actually a lot longer than we intended this to be, but I think that's a we'll say that's a positive uh, because I think it shows that we're really enjoying what we're doing, which is definitely the case. Uh, and so thank you guys so much for sticking with us for enjoying the episode. Uh, if you have some top picks from Streets of New Capenna uh, before the actual release later this week, feel free to share them. Let us know what kinds of things you plan to build, what kinds of cards you want to be using and that kind of stuff. Uh, and if you just have a funny, funny story for the week, share it with us, man. We could <laughs> we could always use a good story. Uh, but guys, thank you so much. I want to reiterate this is going up on our channel as well as hopefully in the Spotify app. That's the plan. Uh, but uh, if you are not already subscribed to Country Fried, please go check him out. Releasing uh, a lot of a lot of content, doing a lot of live streaming as of now. Uh, and so you can go hang out with him live. He's a great guy. Uh, and Country Fried, thank you again for for working with me on this podcast. I'm excited for for episode two. Yeah, man, absolutely. Much appreciated. And glad to have you back, brother. Glad to be back at work. For sure, man. All right, guys, that's it. It's been a glorious day. Thanks for joining us. I just like throwing the glorious thing in there. <laughs>